this episode of In the Fight, coalition forces give the Afghan military control of one of its oldest bases. We see how there are some things that technology just cannot replace. An Air National Guard unit quietly passes a significant milestone. We look at the sacrifices that have been made in Afghanistan. And we see what it's like to be the wife of a Medal of Honor recipient. For members of the 508th Military Police Company, driving around the streets of one of Afghanistan's largest cities requires 100% of their attention at all times. Airman First Class Kellen Carr takes us for a ride and files his report. Members of the 508th MP Company are preparing for another ride through the streets of Kabul. They run through a quick meeting, discussing alternate routes, finish off their coffee, crack a few jokes, and then do a few maintenance inspections. This isn't just any drive. It's a mission. During drive missions, they are responsible for getting other service members, civilians, and contractors from point A to point B safely. That's not always an easy task with everything they have to look out for in Kabul. Kabul traffic, there's there's no such thing as stop signs or blinkers, so you, you always have to be prepared for the worst. Uh, people, to, you know, traffic's pretty crazy here, so. It is stressful at times. Especially since we're in the city, we have a lot of vehicles and everything, every two feet there's an IED indicator. So you kind of just have to like, you know, use your gut instinct on where to push on, you know, when to stop. Uh, but you know, we, we just try to we just try to have fun. We just try to make every situation fun. Although these Jersey boys do like to have fun and keep things light, they are fully aware of how serious their mission is. We are in Afghanistan and anything can happen and you always have to be vigilant with what, what goes on outside. It gets a little scary when someone juts out of the road and kind of walks towards you, not, not caring that it's a big MRAP coming at them. Once you've done it for three months, you're kind of used to it, so you kind of like know what's out there, you know? Members of the drive team joke that they are combat taxi drivers, but that's just a small part of their job. Taxi solo quick. Dabs it here. People have to go places still, you know, still business to be done, so uh, we're there security and protection. MP is multi-purpose, that's what we do. The time it takes to complete a mission, as well as the threat levels, vary from day to day. But Sergeant Mavali says that's why he enjoys the work that he and his team do. I, I can't imagine myself doing anything else. After another safe pickup, the drive team will have some downtime before duty calls once again. Airman First Class Kellen Carr, Kabul, Afghanistan. As the Afghan military continues to train and build up its forces, the 3rd Infantry Division is stepping aside from one of its oldest bases so that the Afghan National Army can take control. Army Specialist Tim Morgan brings us this story. It is not the sound of strikers that nearby residents are hearing. It's the sound that marks the start of a war that's coming to an end. For over nine years, Forward Operating Base Lagman has held its own beneath the mountains outside of Kalat, Afghanistan, inside Zabul province. But the days of Lagman are now numbered. Starting at the end of February, coalition forces will relinquish control of FOB Lagman. As we draw down our numbers of forces here, this is the base that we're going to transition to the Afghan National Army. The tearing of wood and the clank of machinery fills the air as the base is scaled down to a size the ANA can sustain. It will be the first of several bases around Kalat to be handed over to the ANA. As for the service members and contractors at Lagman, some will be going home, but most will move to nearby Fab Apache, where they will continue to support the Afghan army and police. However, 
Kalat residents can expect to see less coalition movement along Highway 1. But certainly the traffic that goes in and out of Logman, that'll go away. That may be a welcome uh, sign for the, uh, for the Afghans. The memories of Bob Logman will live on with those who lived and served here and with the friends and family of whom this base was named after. Staff Sergeant Anthony S. Lagman made the ultimate sacrifice when his team came under small arms fire while clearing a village in a nearby province. He was assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 22nd Infantry Regiment, 10th Mountain Division out of Fort Drum, New York. Reporting from Bob Apache, I'm Specialist Tim Morgan. Though coalition forces are turning more and more of their bases over to Afghan forces, the need to defend these posts is still of the utmost importance. Marine Staff Sergeant Jason Price takes us to the range where service members are honing their close quarters combat skills. Two, three, one. One, two, three. Out. This mixed group of Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines all serve as part of a force protection team which provides one of the first lines of defense for their base. The senior members of the team, like Petty Officer First Class Aaron Prophet, are sharing their skills with junior members to help everyone become even more effective in close quarters combat. Each one of us throughout Force Protection Bravo brings a different skill set to the team, and uh, all I was doing was uh, lending my part in it too, what I've gained throughout the years. It's something that's standard in the MP SRT lanes, so it's kind of like a SWAT technique in a sense, where we try to learn how to maneuver around corners, try to take up corners and try to just make sure we don't flag each other. That's the hardest part right now. Anytime you start flagging somebody, that's when you have the problems. Even with their shared backgrounds and experiences, it seems new members of the team were able to pick up techniques while solidifying shooting fundamentals. The first thing that comes to mind is uh, getting used to that safety. I mean, when we're at the range back home, I mean, it's very safe, very risk averse. But here, I mean, you know, we're going from target to target. And uh, that's something that you need to practice is being able to switch between uh, safety and fire. A lot of times soldiers want to just go to fire and leave it there. And then they'll continue walking down the street or start maneuvering down highways or hallways and not actually go back to sea. And that's when you start having your negligent discharges that injure somebody. And that's just one thing we really don't want to see at all. The movement under fire was enjoyable. It was relaxing. I just don't really get to do that on a normal range. I mean, it's nice to, you know, actually get hands on of what you might actually be doing. One safety topic that seemed to be on everyone's mind. Muzzle awareness. Muzzle awareness. Muzzle awareness. It's being aware of at all times where your muzzle is facing. Being able to move your body with your muzzle to both engage targets and remain safe at the same time. With safety in mind, the team was able to try a few new drills while learning new techniques from senior members. Whichever area you may be assigned to as a military member, if your particular FOB has a force protection team or you want to get more involved, I highly encourage it. Not a bad way to spend the first seven hours of the day. Marine Staff Sergeant Jason Price, that was beautiful. Kabul, Afghanistan. I like it. I'm Specialist Tyler Kuzeski from Gayville, South Dakota, stationed here in Camp Air John Kuwait. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone back at home. Mom, Dad, Sam, and Chandler, I'll see you soon. My name is Mass Sergeant Kuzeski. I'm here at Fort McNair. I'd like to give a shout out to my wife and kids in Gloucester, Virginia. Hi, I'm Sergeant Josh Shannon from Armour, South Dakota. I'd like to say hi to my mom, Randy, Jesse, and Laurel. I love and miss you guys. I can't wait to see you. Coming up, we see how there are some things that technology just cannot replace. And an Air National Guard unit quietly passes a significant milestone. Check out DividsHub.net for the latest accurate and reliable information as In the Fight continues. During which war did the United States officially begin training military working dogs? The answer when we return. With the new Military 24-7 app from Divids, you turn your favorite mobile device into a window to the front lines. Connect with your nation's finest men and women through our video and photography archives and stay up to date with news reported directly from service members. Quickly share information and breaking stories with friends via Facebook, Twitter, or email. News, photos, video, your military 24-7. From combat-related stress to the day-to-day -day stressors of life. This pact is gonna be completed. This is the fourth time this week. Stress can affect every Marine and Marine family. 
The De-Stress Line provides anonymous counseling for Marines and Marine families when it's needed most. If you're feeling the effects of stress, call today and let us help you win your personal battles. During which war did the United States officially begin training military working dogs? The answer is B, World War II. The military relies heavily on its technology to aid the warfighter in his or her daily missions. But even the most sophisticated technology cannot replace man's best friend. NATO Channel correspondent Jake Tupman shows us in his story. Improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, are a favored technique used by insurgents to target coalition and Afghan forces, and are also responsible for the deaths of countless civilians. And despite developing sophisticated anti-IED equipment, one tool remains more effective at sniffing out explosives than any other, the military working dog. You know, they're worth every cent, from the training the dog to the soldier going to school. You know, it, it's. It's uncanny their ability to find the explosives. Forward operating base Sharana in the Paktika province of eastern Afghanistan houses more than 30 dogs. Some are permanent residents, but others are deployed to bases across the region. Civilian trainer Dustin Elwin trains the dogs whilst they're at the kennels. This is our OB yard, um, where we do a lot of our obedience, um, our agility work, as you can see. We try to get the dogs real used to any surface. Um, going up and down stuff, getting on uneven surfaces, up on high stuff, jumping through stuff. Anything that we can do to build, build their confidence is what we try to do in here. But it isn't just running and jumping that the dogs are trained to do. Alan is a dual purpose dog. Uh, he's trained in, uh, uh, in explosive detection and also uh, in attack. <laughs> He can attack at any time when he's given an order. <laughs> Whether the dogs are trained to find explosives or narcotics, the thing that sets them apart from the mechanical detection equipment is their nose. We want that dog to understand that the odor's out there somewhere. We want the dog to make sure that he understands when daddy says out, it's to go out and start working for odor. But no matter how well trained the dogs are, success out in the field is entirely reliant on the bond between dog and handler. The most important thing to have with your dog is, an, is, a, is a bond. You need to be able to trust that dog when you're out. Because without trust in that dog, then there's not much reliance. The success of the military working dogs in detecting explosives and narcotics and saving countless lives has made them a high priority target for the Taliban, with large rewards offered for the killing of the dogs and their handlers. But even as the process of transitioning security to the Afghan forces continues, military working dogs and their handlers remain vital to the NATO mission in Afghanistan. Those dogs that we do lose, they're heroes. Um, they're heroes that have four legs. And, you know, every one of these guys that are over here are putting their life on the line. And that includes our, our two-legged soldiers and our four-legged soldiers. This is Jake Tutman reporting from Paktika for the NATO channel. National Guard soldiers and airmen have been heavily involved in homeland security missions since September 11th. Army Sergeant Robert Stevenson takes a look at one Air National Guard unit that quietly passed a significant milestone. It's another typical day in the nation's capital, and while the majority of its citizens go about their daily business, there is one group of citizen airmen who are ready to respond, literally on a moment's notice, to any threat from the skies above and they've been doing this since 9-11-2001. You know, post September 11th, you know, we started uh, flying here 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, in response to it uh, for about three to four months. 
followed uh, right thereafter by kind of starting the steady state alert mission for the next 11 plus years where we're at right now. Flying F-16 Fighting Falcon fighter jets and known as the Capital Guardians, members of the 113th Wing, DC Air National Guard, get the call anytime air traffic controllers in the National Capital Region determine that a possible threat to the region exists. You know, when that horn goes off, doesn't matter what level of posture we're gonna be in, we're gonna react the same way. It's gonna be a full sprint to the airplanes, Everybody knows what they're going to do. I mean, literally, the maintenance guys that come out here, there's usually two guys per airplane. Somebody, the one that's launching, the one that's actually the B-man, who's uh, number two, and then the pilots getting in the airplane. And their job is to get that aircraft started, get the checks, get the weapons armed, get those guys out of there. It's like getting shot out of a cannon is what I, how, how I like to explain it. And while their response might not be noticeable to you and me, you might be surprised at just how many times this happens. Recently, they responded to their 4,000th alert since 9-11. We may not actually get airborne on a sortie. In this event, we didn't get airborne. We got to the end of the runway. They were able to identify the aircraft, and they were able to pull us back before we actually ended up taking off. We're very, very busy. We get out to the runway almost daily uh, in response to this. Which is why these aircraft have to be maintained in tip-top condition 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, what we have here on our team is, uh, you know, I like to think is the top-notch uh, maintainers and not, not taking away from anyone else. Uh, but everyone down here volunteered to come down here for this particular mission. Um, we all had secondary jobs where we were once active and on the flight line. We come down here because of the mission and it's something that we enjoy doing. And they have to treat each mission with the same sense of urgency as the one before because they never know when the next alert will come. The alarm has gone off uh, while we were recovering the airplanes and it takes, uh, uh, it takes a lot of practice, it takes good leadership and uh, it takes good procedures. Because that next alert might just be the real thing. This is a no kidding, no fail mission. I mean, if we do not do our job, then something potentially bad can definitely happen to, uh, to the National Capital Region. And we're, we're protecting the seat of power in the, in the United States, and it's, uh, and it's it, like I said, an extremely, extremely important mission. At Andrews Air Force Base, this is Sergeant First Class Robert Stevenson, National Guard Bureau of Public Affairs. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Vale. I'm the mobility officer for the 311th ESC. I'd like to give a shout out to my family in Seattle, Washington. I love you. Uh, I'll be home soon. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Specialist Jordan Hansen from Sioux Falls, currently stationed in Kuwait. I'd like to tell my mom, Julie, my dad, Rick, and my sister, Callie, that I miss you and I hope to see you soon. Hello, my name is Sergeant Raymer. I'm serving with Demon 29 here at Cape Casey, Korea. I give a warm shout out to my beautiful wife, Casey, my kids, Michael, Stella, Brooke, Katie, Dylan. I love you all. Hope to see you in a couple months. Coming up, we look at the sacrifices that have been made in Afghanistan. And we'll showcase some of the best photos from our service members as In the Fight, presented by Divids, continues. The first Medals of Honor were presented in March of what year? The answer when we return. I want to give a shout out to my family and friends. I want to send a shout out to my husband, to my parents, my family back home. I'd like to give a shout out to my girlfriend. To my family and friends in Lansing, Michigan. To my family out in Tucson, Arizona. To my beautiful wife and children in Des Moines, Iowa. To everybody in Texas. In York, Pennsylvania. Colorado Springs, Colorado. Chicago, Illinois. Harrisburg, Virginia. Orlando, Florida. Oceanside, California. And Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I love you guys. I miss you. And I hope I'll see you soon. Training is about more than muscle. It's about inner strength. So I push myself. That's why I serve in the United States Coast Guard. I train with the best, a team that shares my drive and commitment. We collect intelligence, guard our shores against drug smugglers, and keep our waterways safe because our nation expects more. If you expect more, maybe you were born ready. Find out at GoCoastGuard.com. With the new Military 24-7 app from Divots, you turn your favorite mobile device into a window to the front lines. Connect with your nation's finest men and women through our video and photography archives and stay up to date with news reported directly from service members. Quickly share information and breaking stories with friends via Facebook, Twitter, or email. 
news, photos, video, your military 24-7. The first Medals of Honor were presented in March of what year? The answer is C, 1863. As America enters its 12th year of war in Afghanistan, the cost of conflict is always present. Army broadcasting correspondent Gail McCabe brings us this story. We need to neutralize the target. If I can't neutralize the target, I'm going to do a target. Afghanistan is a war zone. Fire. Where anything can happen. And being prepared is smart. Look to your left. Dangerous? Well, there's always a possibility of danger to suicide bombers. We are in Afghanistan. America and her allies have been fighting in this land for 11 years. At a cost. More than 3,000 coalition fatalities have been reported since the start of Operation Enduring Freedom. More than 2,000 are U.S. Still uh, a lot of soldiers making the a sacrifice and the families that make the sacrifice that goes with them. As much as progress as we made, uh, we're still in a war zone. Colonel Andrew Rowling commands Task Force Bayonet. His headquarters, like all others in this land, keeps alive the memories of those who paid the ultimate price. Rowling, like many others, is on his fourth deployment in the last decade the second to Afghanistan. It's sometimes hard to look back and say, is the sacrifice worth it? But you have to believe it, and I do believe it. Command Sergeant Major Thomas Capel is another who's served multiple tours. Now, as the ISAF Command Sergeant Major, he crisscrosses the country, to be on the same force as you fight bringing for. messages of support, encouragement, Y'all and gratitude. so damn proud. We are engaged in a war, but when you look around and you see all the good things that have been done around the world, that's what we do. That's why we join our service to protect our country. It brings freedom to the American people and around the world, and they're doing a great job doing it. Gil McCabe, Afghanistan. Being a service member deployed away from home is no doubt difficult, but often overlooked are the families that are left behind. They must continue going about their daily lives with the constant fear of a father, a mother, a sibling not coming home. Army Staff Sergeant Jaime Hernandez brings us this story. Clint Romache and his wife Tammy are no strangers to the military lifestyle. I probably don't know any different. I don't know. We, um, my mother was an Army spouse. Grandmother was an Army spouse. High school sweethearts, they wed right after he completed basic training. They were well aware of the possibilities of Clint being sent to war. He had already been to Kosovo, twice to Iraq, and finally to the Nuristan province in eastern Afghanistan. That's where Clint and the rest of his platoon faced the enemy inside the wire. On October 3, 2009, the Taliban launched an early morning attack on combat outpost Keating, an attack so fierce he knew he would be fighting for his and his soldiers' lives. These weren't your average, you know, up in the hill, you know, cave dweller. These guys were, and I'll give them all their respect, they were well trained and they had their mission to do. Clint also has discipline. Using his army training, he calmly assessed and reported the situation while under attack. From there, Clint and other soldiers took out small groups of enemy insurgents that managed to break the outpost defenses and rallied soldiers to help get the dead and wounded to the safety of the aid station. As his platoon battled for their lives, halfway across the globe, Tammy heard from a friend that their men were in serious trouble. We've had so many close calls in the past that you never know when the gamble's up. Back in your mind, it's always, you know, that knock. Um, I try not to think about it, but it's, it's there. You know it's there. Three days later, her phone rang. It's great just listening to him. 
I have gotten those phone calls and I freaked in the past and he was good. He would call within a couple hours. So this time with it being a few days, I was a little upset. <laughs> She's always been independent. Her ability to be that strong, independent woman and to take care of the family and to take care of the business back here, you know, gave me the ability to take care of business over there. Clint survived the Battle of Cop Kitty. What's that? For his actions, he will receive the Medal of Honor. For now, it's a pretty normal life for the Romaches in North Dakota. And Tammy says she's just glad that Clint is here to talk about it. Anytime I can hear him talk, I love it. No, where do you go? From Minot, North Dakota. Nice to see him. I'm Sergeant Jaime Hernandez. Gross. Trash. Divids is a 24-7 operation that provides a timely, accurate, and reliable connection between the media and the military serving worldwide. Through a network of over 200 portable satellite transmitters around the globe and a distribution hub in Atlanta, Georgia, Divids gives you access to the front lines with live and archived broadcast video, still imagery, and print products. Visit our website at DividsHub.net and search through our enormous video and photo library. Register on our website to gain complete access to high-definition content, along with breaking news alerts and webcasts from top military officials. For questions or comments about In the Fight or Divids, you can email us at ondemand at DividsHub.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. As we close, we feature some of the best photos that Divis has to offer. As we listen to Eddie Horst's composition, Pangea. See you next time, In the Fight. <laughs>